Hey everybody, thanks for coming. I'm Dan Rayburn, I'm a professor of practice in nonfiction here. Um, and I am playing the part of my dear colleague, Lena Ferreira. So I'll be reading from Lena's introduction. I would try to do my best Lena impersonation, but I think I would fail <laughs> utterly. So I'll let her words speak for her. Today we have the rare privilege to hear from a writer among writers. And if I may, I'd like to start by thanking her first for being here with us tonight. I truly cannot wait to hear what she has for us this evening. <laughs> so we're going to record it for you, Lena. <laughs> Second, for writing toward what Margaret Cavendish would call the adventure of noble achievements, rejecting wholeheartedly obscure and sluggish security. And third, for championing writers who should never be forgotten. Because it is truly hard to understand what Danielle Dutton has done with her own writing and the founding of the publishing house, Dorothy, for the memory of writers who wrote about and from the edges of society, of literature, and sometimes their own sanity. Just as it is not hard to find a sudden eagerness to join in the revelry that can exist only in the edges only in the bizarre transformations of Lenora Carrington, the dark absurdity of Nell Zink, and the profound associations of Amina Kane. Now, for the formal matter, Danielle Dutton is also an extraordinary writer and thinker who grew up in Central California. She holds a PhD from the University of Denver and an MFA from the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. And she teaches at Washington University in St. Louis. Her published works include Attempts at a Life, a patchwork book, which one critic described as walking the line between fiction and nonfiction, biography and theory, as well as a finalist for the Believer Book Award, Sprawl. and the incredibly reimagined life of Margaret Cavendish. And of course, she also wrote the text for Here Comes Kitty, a comic opera, an artist book of collages by Richard Kraft. And her fiction has appeared in Harper's, Bomb, Fence, Noon, and so many others. <clears throat> Parens, you can tell them I wrote this part, seeing as it might not be true for you, Dan. Sorry, I really hate being sick right now. <laughs> Close parens. Finally. I'd like to close with a quote for Danielle's book, from Danielle's book, Margaret the First, in which she wrote, yet how hard it is to point to a moment, to say there, in that moment, I changed. Because I feel compelled by my decades of religious education to testify of moments of irrefutable change, of the moment when I first heard Lenora Carrington being read aloud in a hair salon in Iowa City. When I first read Margaret the First in an airport in Ohio. When I first started reading to my students at the end of a quarter, both too long and too short, the quarter. Because, quote, how hard it is to say, there in that moment I changed. But also sometimes you feel yourself plunging into life and today, too, is where everything comes together. Please join me in welcoming Danielle Dutton. That was such an amazing introduction. Thank you. I loved it. Um, let me take this off. Thank you all for being here. It's so nice to see you. I actually, the, the lovely gentleman who drove me from the airport to the hotel today was telling me that nobody likes literature anymore no, and nobody reads books. And he, and he said, when I have to read a book, I have to download it and I just, and um, he said, the only person I know who reads books is 75 years old. And I was just like nodding. I mean, I can't really like disagree with him, but at the same time, I was thinking how excited I was to come see all of you tonight. Um, little does he know, here we are, um, loving books and not quite 75 years old. Um, 
So thank you um, to Suzanne for inviting me, and thank you to Starsha for answering my millions of questions. I like to know exactly how everything's going to happen. So if you set up a trip for me, you have to answer lots of questions. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to read some new stories today. Um, and I just, so I have a book forthcoming from Coffee House, I think. I haven't signed the contract, but they said yes. So um, I, th I think it's okay to say that. And it's called Prairie Dresses Art Other. And the four sections are very different. I can see everyone's like live tweeting. She just claimed her book's coming out with Coffee House. <laughs> Be sure you tag Coffee House. Um, uh, sorry. So it's called Prairie Dresses Art Other. And the sections are all really different. And I'm going to read um, two stories from the other section. And then I'm going to close with one story from the prairie section. They're just really tonally different. Um, and I, 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 that's something I'd be happy to talk about. So um, I'm going to start with a really short piece called Acorn. So, Acorn. Several of her friends were writers too, and they talked about the body. Where is the body when you write? You are always writing from the body, they said, but we can't really feel the body in your work. We don't believe in the bodies in your stories. Your stories are all words. Bring the body into your writing, they said. She wasn't sure. When she was writing, she was in her body. She couldn't argue with that. But how to explain that she was somewhere else as well? When she was writing, it was as if she were working from six inches above and in front of her own head. If the energy of writing fell back into her body, all writing stopped. Then she was just herself, sitting in a chair. She was ready to admit to herself, if not to her friends, that keeping that energy afloat was peculiar work, bodily work. It was like bathing a squirming baby that you weren't allowed to look at. Babies are so slippery. You can't believe it the first time you bathe a newborn. It's like trying to wash the water. Writing was like that, like water, more like water than like a body. Wasn't that something she liked about it? Then again, if her friends were able to simply sit in their bodies and write, maybe this meant that their writing was more connected to the world, the real world, which everyone seemed to want. Everyone wanted more of the real, more of the world. Maybe it meant that they could get up from their writing and go do something else immediately, something useful, wash a baby in real life, for example, looking at the baby the whole time. They might even wear those gloves made out of washcloths, little pastel mitts, which made it so that the baby would never slip from their grasp. They could soap the baby's back without any worry that they might drop the baby out of its blue plastic tub and into the dirty kitchen sink. They wouldn't have to worry about the baby's little arm or leg slipping into the garbage disposal, oh God, <laughs> or about the baby sliding out of their ungloved hands and onto the bathroom floor, cracking its head, the blood, oh God, not that she had a baby, not that any of her friends had babies. This isn't a real baby, she thought. What was a baby in a story? It was a word. The word was baby. The word was body. Was her own body a word? She couldn't stop thinking about it all the way home. Body, 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 body. The following day, while she was walking to the grocery store, an acorn fell from a tree, bounced off the sidewalk, and hit her on the left nipple, hit her squarely on the left nipple. But was squarely the right word? Was nipple? Was acorn? It hit her hard, too. Hard, certainly, even if not squarely. That was it. Um, okay, this story is also so cool to be in Chicago and see the lake out there. Um, this story is also from the other section of the book, and it was um, actually published in your very own lovely The Chicago Review, or Chicago Review. It feels like it should have that in front of it. Um, and you would not necessarily know this from the, the, from hearing the story, but it started, um, might have actually started in a class you were in, David. Like, I might have started writing it after a conversation we were reading Sabald, and we had a pretty interesting conversation about um, sort of like who would ever decide to quote so much material without, wasn't that in your class? Yeah, that's funny that you're here. Um, it's so nice to see you without like uh, saying that it came from somewhere else, you know, just sort of writing it right into your own prose. And we had a really great conversation about that. And shortly after that, I started this piece and then I put it away for a long time and then I finished it, which is a thing that I do pretty regularly. Um, I need about two years. Like I write an intro, then two years later, I finish a story. So. Um, this is called One Woman and Two Great Men. 
Among many reflections in Thomas de Quincey's essay, The Last Days of Immanuel Kant, the reader is offered a glimpse at the philosopher's bedtime routine. Kant had a strict habit, it turns out, of reading by candlelight until 10 o'clock, then removing his mind from exertion for one golden half hour, sure that a mind laden with study would be prone to wakefulness, so he simply sat. Until, having removed his mind for the requisite time, he would undress, lie down, and wrap himself in a blanket, cotton in summer, wool in autumn, then, as the air cooled, both both of these together. Once Cronenberg was, oh, I'm just gonna stop and tell you like, I can't speak German, Italian, or ancient Greek, all of which is <laughs> in here. So if you know how afterwards, you can like give me pointers, but for now we'll just ignore all of my mispronunciations. Once Konensberg was in the fullest grip of winter, frost felling ancient oaks and small hills of snow on every pitched rooftop, he'd sensibly switch to eiderdown, or to hit the nail on the head, to a blanket of eiderdown ingeniously stuffed in its upper third with wool instead of feathers, a blanket then both padded and stuffed with which he'd enfold his body. Nesting more than covering, we're told. Here's how. First, he'd sit on the side of the bed and with an agile motion vault obliquely into his lair. Next, he drew one corner of the bedclothes under his left shoulder and passing it below his back, brought it round so as to rest under his right shoulder. Fourthly, by a particular tour d'address, he operated on the opposite corner in similar fashion, finally contriving to roll the blanket around his entire person. How pleasing it is to imagine Immanuel Kant thus enswathed, self-involved as a silkworm, as Thomas de Quincey stands close at hand, snuffing the candle or checking that the curtains are shut against the cold and taking notes mentally, if not literally, noting, for example, how the author of Critique of Pure Reason once nested would often exclaim, is it possible to conceive of a human being with more perfect health than myself? <laughs> Yet you would be wrong in imagining things this way. For the truth of The Last Days of Immanuel Kant by Thomas de Quincey is that not much of it is, in fact, by Thomas de Quincey. The truth, which hides not behind lies, but behind de Quincey's curious relationship to quotation and citation, is that this intimate description of Kant's bedtime routine, routine comes from Aragot Andreas Vazianski's 1804 Immanuel Kant and Seinen Letzen Lieberziaren, which de Quincey translated and annotated in such a way as to leave the reader with the impression that the words and experiences were de Quincey's very own. And so it is Vazianski, not de Quincey, snuffing Kant's candle, Vazianski, not de Quincey, with the presence of mind to inform us that when hosting a party, rather than keep a bottle of decanted wine with the servant, Kant, Anacreon Tickly preferred to keep one at the elbow of every single guest. Who Vazianski was is not of great importance, a friend, a priest, a musical inventor, because it is de Quincey whom we think of as we read. It is Thomas de Quincey that history remembers, I say to my companion sitting opposite on this bullet train as we look out at the landscape whizzing by. Looking at a rainbow shooting straight up from a field, I recall an interview with the Belgian writer Jean-Philippe Toussaint, who, when asked what made his books funny, answered, work, work, work. Yet I can't help thinking, I tell my new friend, that the humor I find in the last days of Immanuel Kant is at least partly accidental. Or perhaps that's me eating straight out of its hand. Take the section in which de Quincey explains that Kant is not popular here and now, the here and now in question being 19th century England, because he cannot be. And he cannot be because he wrote in German, and because of what in German he wrote. He wrote, all of the elements of the manifold of I, where I is some arbitrary intuition, are such that H is or can become conscious in thought, that all of these elements taken together are accompanied by the I think. I think, announces De Quincey in the middle of a tremendously long footnote printed in an exceptionally tiny font, yet offered with total conviction, as though these are the final words on a man and his body of work, popular, the transcendental philosophy can never be. Thus, we have an essay written and not written by Thomas De Quincey about a philosopher whose philosophy, the essay's writer slash not writer, tells us cannot be liked or not liked by many. And yet, he goes on, any thinking person must be interested in Kant the man. A great man, he argues, though in an unpopular path, will always be an object of liberal curiosity. And indeed, there is ample evidence with which to back him up. From Diogenes Laertius to our very own here and now, we seem to long to know just how the great man eats his breakfast, in Kant's case, oatmeal, promptly at five each morning. How he takes his exercise, a walk after dinner each night alone, so as not to be bothered with conversation, talk forcing one to take an air through the mouth, whereas Kant preferred to take an air through his nostrils, mm -hmm. ensuring the air reaching his lungs would arrive in a state of less rawness, especially in winter, the nose being an instrument of warming, how he sleeps in swathed, and above all, how he dies. Like all great men, Kant died without any sweat, only his 
right, his eye was rigid, writes Vaziansky, writes De Quincey, and his face and lips became discolored by a cadaverous pallor, and that was all. No crying or pleading, no vomit or piss. Unlike the rest of us, a great man looks out at the abyss and simply exhales, or so we are told. And so we can hold it in our hands, this small old book in bright green leather, the works of Thomas de Quincey, last days of Immanuel Kant and other writings, and I hold it up to show my neighbor as our train plunges into the dark. De Quincey, I say, as we re-engage the sunlight, the daylight, is best known as an opium eater. In fact, we are told he was a visionary at six. His earliest memories were dreams. When his sister Jane died aged three, the younger Thomas assumed she'd pop back with the spring rains like a bulb. When his sister Elizabeth died aged nine, he stood beside her corpse and fell into a trance. Thus, Thomas took leave of his youth, a school, a tutor, a tutor, a school. Some called him weak and effeminate others gifted and premature. Throughout his life, De Quincey would be troubled by pain in his guts. A brilliant student, fluent in Greek, in 1802 he ran away from Manchester grammar, tossing his trunk down the stairs one moonless night. Of course, the lives of the romantics were filled with desperate flights, but De Quincey was perhaps the most adept at sleeping in actual fields and trudging through mountainous rain. A smallish teenager, he calls the sunset pompous. He watches the girls in bonnets. Then he is found and disappears again to befriend a virgin whore in London's soggy streets. At last, he arrives in Worcester College Oxford, but he'll run away from that school too, calling it ancient mother. You might, I say, seeing a skeptical sort of spasm pass over my companion's face, be inclined to think I inject so much moisture into the story because of the drops now pelting our window, and so be more likely to doubt the truth of what I say. But the fact is that the first 40 years of the 19th century saw excessive rainfall in England. Truly, there were those who called it outstandingly wet. Interestingly, I continue, as the horn blasts and we barrel past a cow, for all the care with which De Quincey recounts Vazioski's account of Kant, the great man to whom he was truly devoted was William Wordsworth. He called himself at 17 zealously attached, then went to live for a decade in Mr. Wordsworth's beloved dove cottage, its tangle of ivy and scallop pink walls, where he irritated the elder poet's more fastidious nature. It is such a shame to meet the ones we worship. De Quincey would later advise, never describe Wordsworth as equal in pride to Lucifer, no. But if you have occasion to write a life of Lucifer, set down that by possibility, in respect to pride, he might be some type of Wordsworth. <laughs> Eventually, he settled in Edinburgh with his wife and chowder of kids. As regards the De Quincey children, three boys died, one gruesomely, one in China, and Sarah Coleridge accused the father of neglecting them all, and worse. Yet he was silver-tongued, even or especially in his insults. That no one in England read Kant was a sign he was sure of the nation's intellectual emasculation. Goethe was no good. Coleridge was a thief. Incendiary was De Quincey, always catching his hair on fire, his haystacks of papers, too. When he died at 74, a semblance of youth came over his face. He looked, we're told, a boy of 14. Thank you, he said, then simply expired. They called him a gracious corpse. Now from the window of this speeding train, I see hill after hill after hill and all their grasses blurring. Incidentally, the writer I've been most recently reading on De Quincey in an essay called Thomas De Quincey was also the translator into Italian of Gli Ultima Giorni di Immanuel Kant. And so I tell my drowsy companion, for indeed it seems this train will never stop its oscillation, never meet an ocean, never approach a mountain it can't pass. The writers begin to blur like the grassy hills. That writer's name is Fleur Yegi, born in Switzerland and educated by nuns. There were horses and she rode them, speaking Italian, German, and French. Later, she modeled for pictures, but found it dull. Known for being private, she lives in Milan with frescoes on her walls. I came to her work through her fourth book, a slender novel in which, as in the life of its author, a Swiss girl is sent to be educated in a boarding school managed by nuns. The school is in the Appenzell, where the writer Robert Walser died while walking one Christmas day, someone had the sense to snap a picture of the body, hat just out of reach, final line of footsteps caught forever in the snow. It is as if, having met his fate on the path, Mr. Valser simply agreed. 
When people mention that Yegi translated De Quincey, they invariably cite as evidence the last days of Immanuel Kant. Has ever a translator, I mean here De Quincey, so eclipsed the one he translates, I mean now Vaziansky? Emerson wrote, do not go where the path leads, go instead where there is no path and leave a trail. How interesting then to go where the path goes and leave a trail nevertheless. For her part, Fleur Yegi still lives, so there is nothing yet to say about her death. At times, it feels like all the stories that need to be written are written, and all the lives that need to be lived have been lived. And then, this will be the last thing I read. Um, this is from the prairie section of the book. I'm obsessed with the prairie. You all live on the prairie, even though it's hard to tell. From here, um, it more, looks more like you live in like a gothic novel. <laughs> um, this is an amazing view. So the prairie stories all take place in the Midwest, um, and some of them are bursting with flowers. This one has some flowers, but some of them have just long lists of flowers. Um, I feel like more flowers. We need more flowers in fiction. Um, and this story, I started it, when I was writing it, I was looking a lot at Whistler's Nocturne in Black and Gold, that painting from 1874. I was just kind of obsessed with it, and I sort of wanted to write a story that felt like it matched that painting, and um, and also his whole idea of the of the nocturne, of a painting that would be a nocturne, a term from music that would be more interested, like it would emphasize um, atmosphere over plot or narrative, I guess, um, and also that it's like a nocturne is sort of takes place in the absence of direct light, which just the, I, that phrase is very appealing to me. So that is where this story nocturne came from. So nocturne. From the back seat, her son explains what would happen if she got sucked into a black hole. Moon-faced flowers are wild sweet potato with heart-shaped leaves and hairy seeds, white and alive in the night. It's a perfect example of exponential growth, he says. In summer, the light stays long. Cicadas apocalyptic with the windows rolled down, fast down the hill toward the Ohio heading home. On the opposite bank, an oil refinery spreads into Kentucky, its tall stacks shooting flames into the sky. Imagine your body being split in two halves, he says. West Virginia is wild. It's right there on the signs. Montani Semper Liberi. Montani Semper Liberi means mountains are always free. Then imagine both halves of your body being split in half, and then those halves being split in half, then those halves being split in half, and then those halves being split in half. So you just keep splitting your pieces until you were only molecules. You were only molecules, she thinks, and those sweet potato flowers, like a million wagging moons. Mom, he says, are you listening? In a story she read last week at the beach, a man in a straw hat cut off a duck's head while the children stood and watched. Lid, 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 the man called. Qua, 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 said the duck. Then the head fell to the grass and the duck's feet ran its bottom half away. Yes, she tells him, yes, she shouts over the wind. It's the hottest week in the world. In Sweden, a forest fire has crossed the Arctic Circle. In Oman, the overnight low is 120 degrees. Near a small German town famous for its asparagus, long deserted bombs are exploding beneath the trees. And just downstream in Czechia, a hunger stone has emerged in the Elbe, the water having writ, hit a record low. If you see me, weep, it reads, the words etched desperately four centuries before. A second message emerges upriver. We cried, we cry, and you will cry. But the dead are loud as toasters, the fish flap in the mud. Meanwhile, farther north, seen only from the sky, ghostly landscapes rise up via drought. The blueprint of an 18th century mansion on a lawn, a World War II airfield beneath a Hampshire farm, an elaborate Victorian garden long ago cut down. Looking at the drone shot of that non-house on her phone, she thought of pressed flowers gone brown. No, those cyanotypes of seaweed she saw once on display. A woman named Anna Atkins laid carefully dried specimens on chemically treated paper. Left out in the sun, the seaweed burned its own pale shadow onto a deep blue page. The smell of Kentucky is flammable, damp, the refinery like a spaceship. 
This Blue Drama, that exhibition was called. In 1672, her son informs her, Robert Boyle read an entire magazine by the light coming off a piece of rotting veal. From Delaware to Kentucky, they've counted 15 dead deer by the side of the road. Once the sun set, the deer began to glow. It was a neck, he says. It was this disgusting, fatty piece of baby cow neck. At a cement table by a grassy field, they eat warm melon and pretzels and hard-boiled eggs. A red-winged blackbird trills on a stalk. An old man in the darkened lot moves toward them like a glacier. I love summer, her son says, oblivious to the stranger, listening to cicadas ringing on and on. We should just keep driving to wherever it's summer, and when it's not summer there, we should drive to wherever it's summer next. The air is thick with meadow grass and bugs. On the one hand, on the highway, traffic rushes past, but pale moths twist over the field as if there were no time. A part of her whirls outward with those moths, out and out to native plants as weedy as her kid, a crooked stem aster, a blazing star. When she was small, smaller than he is now, and quiet, much quieter than him, her mother wallpapered their apartment in a stylized jungle print. The leaves on the banana trees curled away like ribs. The eyes of the jungle cats looked out like human eyes. Every night when the lights clicked off, she saw men stepping between the leaves and right off of the walls. At last, the stranger has arrived. Hello, she says. Her son turns. The old man opens a toothless mouth. He is trying to tell them something, and they are trying to hear it, but it takes him 30 years to get it out. I know, she says, when he is done. He turns his gaze to the clamorous field. No, he shakes his head. You've got a long way to go. Night comes to Kentucky with red clouds and green sky, and then the fields are flat. No breeze blows, some satellites shine. With the old man asleep in the seat beside her and her son asleep in the back, she is the only one to see the electric billboard in the middle of nowhere that says, Jesus recycled humans. The road rises up. Two weeks at her mother's house has emptied her all the way out. O oh, house in Delaware, bought by a dead husband. O oh, house, a vast expanse of white. That first morning, she stepped into the yard and everything was wrong. Pool, umbrella, plastic shark, as if she'd never been there. On the rocks, her mother hissed before even brewing coffee. Several minutes ticked away as she waited for panic to pass. But the sun was clearly rising on the wrong side of that yard or else she'd woken back to front, and this was what it was like to face the ass side of your mind. The road rising steeply, the trees nearer the road, the moon like a beacon now between sweet gum and ash and pine. In Pennsylvania, there's a house made of glass where you can stand in one spot and watch the sunset and the moonrise at the exact same time. How comforting it sounds up on a hill, surrounded by woods, invisible from the road. Who'd want to live in an invisible house, rings her mother's voice in her mind. A neon something flashes past. She remembers a half-forgotten class about the beginning of everything, back before the bang. A whole semester of lectures on the origin of the world. A yawning gap there was, to start, and regions of fire and frost, and salt, but nowhere grass. In every direction, the fields run gray, as if the night absorbed their green. But once upon a time, all matter and light were one. Then the stars, and then the fireflies, and then the grass. She has no idea of the time. The clock on the dashboard tells her it's tomorrow. She searches out her phone on the floor, but the car swerves, surprising her, and the old man stirs in his sleep. For hours, the road just goes. Traffic has thinned, and her mind makes little visits to that story she read at the beach. Oh, but I do want to be a bee frightfully, said the girl called Ketsia, who sometimes dreamed of camels. But she wasn't allowed to be a bee. She had to pick something else if she wanted to play the game. A rooster, a bull, a donkey, a sheep. 
Then when she raised her eyes from the book, it was as if the story had dreamed the bees. Tiny golden bees were hovering above the sand, and the waves were going wild, since somewhere out there a tropical storm was turning and headed in. So they fled her mother's house, days of endless rain, fast through West Virginia and Kentucky heading home. It's the hottest week in the world. In Siberia, the permafrost is collapsing into holes. In California, the tide at night blooms an eerie blue. A wildfire in Texas caused a storm with one inch hail. Then a billboard warns her, hell is real. And like a joke, the road descends to another refinery and its pipe stacks shooting flames into the sky. All is passing memory, she thinks. In the largest of those Siberian holes, what scientists turn a mega slump, they've discovered an ancient forest and plants untouched by the light of the sun for 45,000 years. The locals are afraid. They call the slump a door and claim it makes sounds in the dark. Their hands are cracked and shaking. Who wants to crawl inside? When they walk over the tundra, the ground beneath their boots turns to jelly with every step. First it's one hole, and then another, and then at the bottom of the deepest, they find a frozen lake. The ice is black and solid, but someone sees something inside, down inside that lake. He gets on his hands and knees, brushes away the snow. Look, she says, she can't help herself. Sparks from the refinery are drifting through the night sky like luminescent plankton. The old man's toothless mouth expels cool air and bats. Where are we, cries a voice in the car. The road begins to turn. They are driving upside down on the bottom of the planet. She wishes she could tell him the truth. She says, we're almost home. Thank you. I'm happy to answer questions if anybody has any. Yes, Dan is it? Yes, Hi. Uh, I have a question I guess about genre, mm -hmm. which is kind of a, seems to be sort of a real North American fixation. And like with my students this morning, after we got done reading Attempts at a Life, we had a real debate about like, what is this? And we can't decide, <laughs> that's always a sign that something really cool and interesting is happening, when you don't know what to call it. But I'm wondering if, if you have a like a name, mm -hmm. do you consider it fiction? This is a fiction series. Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you so much for reading Attempts at a Life. That's so awesome and nice of you. Um, yeah, I mean, when I started, so Attempts at a Life was my first book, and I started writing it right after I finished my MFA so that summer while I was waitressing here in Chicago at Silver Cloud, um, which I don't know if it's still there in Bucktown. And once I found $50 on the sidewalk on my way to work, to work the brunch shift, which was like the best day of my life. <laughs> Some drunk dummy had just like dropped it on the way getting into a cab, I guess. Anyway, um, I wasn't sure what I was doing. So I had only started writing barely before I applied for an MFA. And I only got into two schools and I came to the Art Institute. And then if you know anything about the program there, it's like you're barely taking writing classes. I was like doing bookmaking, filmmaking, sound, fiber art. And then like I would take a couple of writing classes. So I sort of started writing not really knowing what it, I was a history major at school. I had never heard the term creative writing as an undergrad. Um, so I think I started writing not really knowing what I was doing, but like constantly in conversation with other art forms and um, so I've always thought of my work as very spatial I'm often that, I mean that's why I'm so obviously drawn to thinking about like Whistler's idea of nocturne and I want to write a story like that and so my writing tends to come in from that I guess a lot of the time um, rather than like rather than having the idea for a story um, but but in terms of what I call it so when I wrote that book um, I really wasn't sure so I wasn't sure what I was doing, and I had just, I then I started the PhD at the University of Denver, where you, at the, the MFA here, you don't have to track, you can just take whatever classes you want, but um, the PhD is in English and Creative Writing at the University of Denver, and you have to track, you know, you have to be fiction or you have to be poetry, um, and I got there and I was like, I don't want to do that. Um, 
but I had to, and I was super resistant, and I started taking poetry <laughs> workshops, and all the poets were like, you're definitely not a poet. <laughs> um, so I, but in fiction classes, people were like, there, what's the story here? Like, do you know anything about narrative arcs? Um, so I basically just didn't fit anywhere. Um, but when the book came out, I thought it was seemed a lot funnier to call it fiction. Like, that seemed like a bolder move somehow, because I think because poetry, contemporary poetry feels quite capacious. Um, and it seems like you could almost say, this is a poem about almost anything. Sorry, I mean, I'm sure I'm annoying poets right now. But it felt much more capacious in that moment. Um, and whereas fi fiction felt a lot more rigid, and so it seemed funnier to say it was fiction. Um, and, and funnily, like maybe one of the first readings I ever had was at Brown um, for that book. And Renee Gladman, who was one of my heroes, um, was sitting like in the front row, and I didn't know her at all. Um, and I, I gave this similar answer that I thought it was funnier to call it fiction. I felt I was like, I think fiction needs me more than poetry needs me, which is like such a stupid hubristic thing to say. But I, Renee was like nodding emphatically, and I thought I must be right because I like worshipped Renee Gladman. Um, and then I started a press to publish her books. And it's pub day in our 12th year today. So we just published two. Oh. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, my answer. But I think I've become more of a fiction writer as time has gone on, for whatever reason. Maybe because I got hired to teach fiction, and I talk about it all the time. It rubbed off on me. I had to read craft books so that I could teach it to other people. So I was like, I don't know. How do I talk about this? Anybody else? Well, I just have a question about humor. Yeah. Um, is that, obviously, that's something you're thinking about. If you're choosing what genre based on like whether it's funny or not. To follow yeah. That. Um, and, yeah. And you mentioned, you know, this French writer who. Jean-Philippe Toussaint, very okay. funny writer, okay. yeah. Okay, yeah, work, mm -hmm. work, work. Yep. Um, and then the kind of inadvertent humor of the kind of pompousness of De Quincey's yeah. definitive footnotes. Mm -hmm. um, Pompousness yeah. is very funny to me. Yeah, like, me endlessly too. funny. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so she said at the University of Chicago. <laughs> <laughs> um, it feels yeah, very yeah. silly. Do you? I mean, is, does that guide your um, pompousness? <laughs> um, no, I don't know. I, what's my humor. Humor. Yeah. Yeah. I never particularly plan. So yeah. I do feel like my work's either funny or not that funny. Um, and but I don't know why. Like yeah. something. Um, my husband would disagree. He thinks I'm always funny. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, in my writing, like yeah. uh, normally I know something's funny when I. It just makes me laugh, and then I realize like, oh, this one's maybe a funny one. But it's um, it's a lot harder to read funny stuff, so I tend not to, because um, it feels like you're bombing, you know, um, right. if nobody laughs, you know, so, um, but it's really fun to write, I guess, but no, I don't think it's genre, that's a good question, I haven't thought about it, but it's definitely in this forthcoming book, there's like a funny section, yeah. and then the not funny well, the section. Well, the piece is very funny. I mean, I think it's funny, <laughs> yeah, I mean for it to be funny, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. well, the layers of um, reference. Yeah, I do really think De Quincey's piece is hilariously yeah. funny. Yeah. yeah. Um, and But also, tons of this, that piece is me quoting wildly from other people. And um, and after that Sabald conversation, that suddenly seemed very funny to me, too. I don't think it's funny in Sabald, but it seemed funny after our conversation. It's so funny that you're here, too, sure. David. Um, yeah, so. I have a question. Yes, yes. Um, can you, uh, so I would say, like even the stories you read right now, are, I feel like you're working in like like brevity as like a way that your your writing and sprawls you know pretty short and mm -hmm. um, you know your work is tends to go for the shortness, which I think is I think maybe one of the reasons that like well your writing's really lyric also of course and like you know, number like I said number one fan here, um, Makes sense. but uh, I think that like uh, briefness to it kind of adds to this idea of kind of mixed genre or, or poetry esque or whatever you want to call it. Um, so I just was wondering if you wanted to talk or if you could talk about um, yeah the role of brevity in your writing and your your work. Mm -hmm. um, that's a question I think it's hard. Um, some yeah sometimes I feel like I'm about to psychoanalyze myself. Um, I once read this really great interview a long time ago with George Saunders where he said he thinks style is actually like a sort of part of, um, it, it's like a, 
a skill subset that actually has to do deeply with who you are. And like what feels cheesy to you is like somehow it's like antithetical to you or what is hard to you to do in writing is like there's some deep philosophical meaning about who you are. In, in, and so for example, I have a very hard time writing dialogue and I'm also very awkward in conversation with other people. Um, mm -hmm. And so like I, I find that kind of curious to think about. But um, as I ramble on in this question about brevity, I would say that I think part of it is actually that I live in fear of boring people. Um, and so I, and I always have, um, and for like, again, psychoanalytic reasons that I will spare you. So I'm always trying to like compress as much like pow into a small amount of space because I like, I loathe the idea of writing a filler sentence or something. Um, but also I'm like, it, I, like I, when I write a short story that's like 12 pages long, I'm just like, oh my god, like I'm so impressed with myself that, um, and I, it's funny because in my classes I teach, it's like, you, this story, your stories must be 12 to 25 pages long, which is like ridiculous because I can hardly write a 12 page story. Um, but yeah, and so in my, like Sprawl, I, Sprawl is a novel that's one long paragraph, but I wrote it by stitching together tiny things like over years. And then um, Margaret the First is also a novel, but it's like vignettes and it's in three sections. So it's like, I can, I, I only am able to work in short forms for I, whatever reason, yeah. Thanks. Irina. I have a question. Um, this is a little bit simple, but you talked about how you're kind of a slow writer and it takes you two years yeah. to finish the story. And I'm curious, like, um, how do you organize projects that are in the process mm -hmm. so, like, when you're not sure if it's going to be something or... Yeah. I mean, I'm not a super organized person per se, but... Um, well, the one thing I would like to say about this is that it's if, if lots of you are writers in here, which I am guessing, it's so important not to th not to throw away anything you write, especially when you like it and you don't know why. So the literally the the Kant story I wrote like in a burst, like three pages. And then I was like, what is this? I don't have any idea for how to finish this. And I was really sad because I liked the prose, but I had no ideas. Like, I, I don't feel like I'm an ideas writer. Um, so I put it away and then uh, two years later I read it and I was like, this is funny. Like, why am I such a weenie? Just finish the story and then I did. And so it, it came together. And then the acorn story you just read at the beginning, um, was I actually combined two separate things I'd written over like, like one was three years old and one was like five years old. And then one day it just occurred to me how I could write between those two things. So I'm just a big believer in keeping all of your work and revisiting it regularly. Like you might not know what to do, but just keep it. Like I keep a file of things that I don't know what to do with. And then I reread them on a fairly regular basis so that they're just sort of like there. Not like, I'm not saying like monthly. I'm saying like once or twice a year, I revisit that folder to see if I, I can find a spark in the things that seemed dead to me. Um, yeah, and because you never know. So in Margaret the First, my novel, um, there's a paragraph that like someone got tattooed on them, and when people would like quote, yes, that is the second time someone has gotten something I wrote tattooed on them. It's complete strangers that I learned about like through Instagram or something. Um, it seems crazy to me too. Um, but like the, the thing that like kept getting like, you know how people, I don't even know how you do it. You type it in a square and then you put it on Instagram. W when people did that, it was like the same thing over and over. And it was something I had written in a short story at the School of the Art Institute, a super shitty short story. But I'd always really loved those like four lines. And then one day when I was working on Margaret, 10, 12 years later, I was like, oh, I just suddenly realized that thing would fit there and I put it in and then that was the thing that people were like constant. So you just don't ever throw them away. You don't know, they could be, don't kill your darlings, I guess, is what I'm saying. Thank you all so much for coming, I appreciate it. Yeah.